Sunday, you know, I've preached a lot of these, and uh, as I've shared on several occasions, when you come to the special days of the year, it's tough to be unique. It's tough to find something you haven't already done, so I took a fresh look, and I am indebted to a fellow pastor for some things about an outline that I looked through, but uh, uh, there's a famous pastor whom you might know. His name is Jack Hayford. His favorite saying is, I milk a lot of cows, but I make my own cheese meaning you read a lot, you listen to a lot of stuff and talk to a lot of people and when you're done you put it together the way the Lord thinks or you think the Lord wants you to present it. So I was thinking about the different points of view 
to those involved in this story. Last week I mentioned that some people see life in a positive light and some people see life in a negative light. Some people see problems, other people see opportunities. And uh, Palm Sunday is kind of like that and uh, it, I don't mean to be trite but there will be cheers and there will be tears. You know who cheers, right? Do you know who has tears? That would require a response from the audience. Okay. Well, then we'll go through this unfamiliar story and see how you, how you fare. What? Jesus did. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that foal, of a donkey. He was fulfilling a prophecy written by Zechariah about four, uh, actually, we're, we're guessing, but around 500 years earlier. Zechariah began his ministry about 520 BC. So now we're in 33 AD. So it could be 550 years, perhaps. So uh, don't know exactly because we don't know the date of when Zechariah wrote. We know pretty much when this is. So here's the verse. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. This is out of Zechariah 9. 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Today's prognosticators, the seers, if you will, the supposed fortune tellers can't go very far in advance with their prophecies, and they can't be very detailed, and most are wrong. I was reading a headline last night about how Trump is going to win this election. There's a prophecy for you. Somebody throw her a fish. <laughs> if we go down that road, we'll never get back to this road. <laughs> <clears throat> this trip into Jerusalem and all the surrounding events had been in the planning stages in the mind of God for over 500 years. Actually, longer than that. Let me tell you exactly how long. Here's a verse from, <clears throat> I believe it's um, Psalms, I can't remember. Anyway, it's verse 8 or whatever chapter it is. All who dwell on the earth uh, will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. I think that's Revelation 19, 8, I think. 21, 8 maybe? I don't know. <clears throat> it says 13, 8, but I don't think that's it. I think it's a cross-reference, but... Anyway, um, the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It means in the mind of God before the world was ever formed, all of this was already laid out. Because God is omniscient. He knows history. He knows what will occur. So why in the world are you nervous about your life? Could everybody just take a breath and relax and go, God, you've got this. God knows. He, he's already taken into account all your stupidity. And for some of you, that was a load. God's already accounted for that when he called you, when he saved you. He's accounted for all of your rebellion, all of your mistakes, all of your whoopses. He's taken it into account already. And his grace and mercy has decided to pursue you and love you to himself. And he knows whether or not you will respond. And yet he pursues you anyway. Wow. That's mercy and love beyond comprehension. That's way beyond the human capacity. Except for Pam. God is sovereign over all creation. Nothing going on in your life that he's not aware of. 
And he's taken into account all the events of history and how that will affect you and his love for you and how his plan for you and his ministry for you and his purpose for you. He's working all of that together for his glory. Would you be willing to be a tool or a pawn in the hand of the living God? Or do you feel you need to elevate yourself and be large and in charge? Can you believe that God would work through the chain of command, beginning with parents? You were born in exactly the right family. Because God knows what it would take to hone the rough edges off of your life. He knows how many mistakes you have to make before you learn your lesson of trust and obedience. God knows exactly what is needed, what pain you must endure before you get the picture. And God mercifully just bides his time, just waits. He's working everything out for his glory. And you can trust him in what you do not understand. You're not called to understand. You are called to stand under and be in submission to God. Oh, that's a hard one. We want the right of first refusal. Lord, I don't like that plan. That plan A is not working for me. Do you have a plan B? How about C or D or E or F or G? Somewhere down the line, there's got to be something better than what you're bringing to me. And God says, oh, no, no, no. You don't learn the lesson here. The lesson the next trial will be even more severe. If you found that to be the case, if you don't learn the lesson on the easy test, you get a harder test. You don't get an easier test. You get a harder one. God's committed to developing you. Now, when Jesus rode in, he came as a king, and they got that. But they did not understand how it was going to work out. They thought they did. <laughs> and I thought about unrealized expectations. It trips up a lot of people. It messes up a lot of personal relationships, a lot of employment relationships. Unrealized expectations. You think it should work out this way, and it doesn't. It works out some other way, and you're not good with that. Okay. But people, most people that I know would prefer to use God to get their agenda fulfilled than to let God use them to get his agenda fulfilled. Yeah, now that was all me. God gave me that. When I say God gave me that, I, don't, I, I should probably rephrase that. It sounds so super spiritual. I don't want you to think that I have a secret telephone at home. Yeah, this is Dale. Oh, yeah, yeah, God, how you doing? Oh, yeah, well, okay. It's not quite like that. But every now and then I'm going along and I'm thinking and praying and meditating and a thought will come into my head that I know is way smarter than I was. So we Christian people say God told me. But in fact, the thought comes to your mind so clearly. It's not an audible voice exactly, but, but you know it's right. Isn't it funny how you know truth when you hear it? Even though you've never heard it, you know, oh, yeah, that's on. That's how I know, because left up to me, you, you just get me. That's not enough. You need to hear the voice of the Lord. So when I'm preparing, I'm asking God to speak through me. If he doesn't speak to me, it's hard for him to speak through me. So that little nugget, preferring to use God rather than let God use you, I think that's a keeper. You can write that down. I don't know if it'll be any good for anything. You can't take it to the bank. They don't want it. I'm going to read from Mark 11. Now, there's a, several parallel passages in the other synoptic writers, meaning each wrote from their own viewpoint. They're called the synoptic gospels. John wrote for a reason, Matthew. Matthew 21, I'm recommending, it's in here somewhere, uh, that, that you read Matthew 21 because it's a parallel passage and fleshes out some of the things in the timeline. Mark writes so concisely, he doesn't put all the details in. Matthew writes to show the Jews that Jesus is the fulfillment of so many Old Testament prophecies. Scholars have cataloged over 300 specific prophecies regarding Jesus' life, birth, death, ministry, and all that. Hundreds of prophecies fulfilled to a T, hundreds of years, some 750 years earlier, as we mentioned, 550 years early. All of these prophecies written so far in advance, proving the hand of God that Jesus was God in the flesh. 
So I'm going to read from Mark 11. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send it here. So they went on their way, found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, what are you doing, loosening the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded, so they let them go. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So Mount of Olives on the east side, Beth, Bethphage and Bethany. And if you're coming from Jericho or some other place through Bethany, you would come and meet here. And so that's why the crowd, there's some followed before and some were coming from Jerusalem because it was the Passover feast. So they were coming both directions. And so this crowd almost immediately grew in size. Just, they saw Jesus and stopped and gathered, and before long there was a throng. But Jesus had chosen to go to Bethphage for a reason. Um, I'll, I'll get to that too in a minute. The word Hosanna, you can see on the screen here, um, is, you see all the relations, from Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, means save, rescue, or savior. And in the Hebrew Bible, it is used only in verses such as help or save and, or I pray in Psalm 118, 25. Save now, O Lord, I pray. I'll read it correctly. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, when the crowd cites these passages, they know what they're saying. They're familiar with the scriptures. They know that it's dangerous and it's volatile. It's explosive. They know that they want a kingdom change. They want freedom from the Romans. They don't want the oppression. They see a political opportunity for a coup d'etat. They want there to be an uproar. They see Jesus as a mighty miracle worker. And they're convinced that this should happen. But it originates in Bethphage. It's a small village that housed the priests, especially those of the Sanhedrin. There were 71 members of the Sanhedrin. There were two seats to the Sanhedrin. One was in Bethphage. At Bethphage, they would decide all of the measurement matters and all the legal matters and all the holy and the unholy matters. For example, Bethphage was constructed by the Sanhedrin to be just within the outer limits of how far you could travel on a Sabbath day's journey. They kept some of the sacrifices over there. They didn't want everything in the temple area. They wanted some distance, but they couldn't be further than a Sabbath day's journey. So this is where the, the ruling seat of the official um, smart guys, the guys, the power brokers, the people who made all the decisions were in Bethphage. Jesus chose Bethphage, picked a cult from there, and demonstrated his kingship because in the Old Testament uh, pattern of things, only a king could ride on an unbroken donkey, foal of a donkey. What is he doing? He's declaring, your authority is no more. I am the king of Israel. Matter of fact, the next day, I'm not looking at my notes. I probably should be. The, these two days are so filled with symbolism. And the next day is when he walks by and sees the fig tree. By, by the way, the, the name Bethphage means unripe figs. 
Bethany means ripe figs. And so when Jesus sees a tree with no figs, he curses it. He says, nobody will ever eat from you again. What's he doing? He's showing that he's warping from the authority that resided in Bethphage. Oh, you're a place of unripe figs. There's no fig in that tree. I'm cursing it. And it died within the hours. He's demonstrating who has real authority and who doesn't. I'd, I'd never seen this before. This, this is pretty powerful stuff. Matthew 24, 21, 43. He says to the crowd there, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing fruits of it. Just prior to this, they had said, Stop these kids from shouting your praises. They're saying, Hosanna, King of David, King of the Lord, blah, blah, blah. Well, it's in their backyard. And Jesus said, no, I'm not going to tell them to be quiet. If they were to be quiet, the stones would cry out. So do you see the, the irony here that the absolute in-your-face symbolism, Jesus is going to their backyard and saying, you have no authority over Israel. This all belongs to me. The kingdom is among you. The kingdom has come. Now, they thought there was a kingship transfer in the works. Jesus knew he had come to die. So unrealized expectations soon get the better of the crowd. So let's talk about the point of view. I'm on the board, it'll just be POV after this. So from Jerusalem, the priests and religious leaders, they decided they weren't so concerned with Rome. After all, Pax Romana, peace with Rome, and Rome is peaceful, blah, blah, blah. After all, they were better than the Greeks before them, or the Babylonians, or Assyrians, or Egyptians. They'd all lived under their rule. Rome was better than those. We could live with that. We can tolerate that. Just, just as an aside here. I was born in 1947. So I saw the great revival in the church in the 50s. And as I look around the church today, meaning the church landscape of the church at large, Somebody asked me this question the other day, so I'm going to steal it. They said, is there anything you wouldn't do? When I grew up, you ask you, a church person, a Christian, what do you believe? They gave you a list of things they didn't do. Let me ask you, is there anything you wouldn't do? We didn't used to go to bars. We didn't used to go to dances. We didn't go, we didn't roller skate. We didn't play cards with face cards. We didn't smoke or chew or go with the girls that do. There's a whole bunch of stuff the church didn't do. Is there anything you wouldn't do? It's getting quiet in here, isn't it? That's just food for thought. It seems to me that the church has become so much like the world, it's very difficult to distinguish the church from the world or the world from the church. The church has not permeated the world so much as the world has permeated the church. There could be a word of caution there that you could decide how that would apply to your life. To the religious leaders in Jerusalem, save us would mean we need to be saved from Jesus. He's trouble going to happen. There's about to be an uproar. They're going to uproot us from our position of power and authority. We've got to eliminate him. There's politics. Similar to what we experience here. The priests were very uneasy. They decided it would be better for one man to die than for the nation to perish. And all of this is happening at the Passover. We're about to have a riot on our hands. We can't have that. So they're on pins and needles. The disciples save meant to be promoted from the bottom to the top. They know the man. They've been walking for three plus years with the guy who does all the stuff. He's got the power. He's got a connection with on high. And he's about to become the ruler of Israel. They're connected. They're excited. They can't wait for something to happen. 
this is the Messiah they've hoped for. He heals the sick. He restores the sight to the blind, can make the lame walk, can make the deaf hear. He can raise the dead. They're all on pins and needles just waiting for the next shoe to drop. The crowd. For six centuries, they've waited for a Savior. The Maccabees wanted somebody to deliver them from Greece. The zealots, like Simon, were willing to pick up the sword. Remember, he cut the ear off of the servant of the high priest when they came to arrest Jesus. I'll start this revolt right now. I'll get this thing rolling. Wouldn't you love to have been there? See Jesus reach down and pick up the ear. Wipe the dirt off and slap it back on the side of his head. There, you're good to go. Can you picture that? You know, there would be blood. There would be dirt. It's dark. You've got to find the ear first off. But I digress. When the crowd was cheering, they were thinking, he's there to save us and he's going to stake God's kingdom right here where we stand. He's going to take a stand against these guys. What's he going to do next? They come with just a few of them. We know the power of God that resides in Jesus. Something big is going to happen, and nothing happens. Can't you just feel the air leave the room? Of course, they're not in a room. They're outside. But can't you just feel the deflation? He picks up the sword, whacks the guy's ear. Jesus heals the ear and is calmly let off under arrest. And they're thinking, what just happened here? How could this go so wrong? I had this whole thing designed. If God would have just done what I said, I'm sure you've never been that way. I'm sure this last last election wasn't that way for you. And I'm sure lots of things in life never work that way. You don't ever think you've got God figured out, do you? You're such a person of faith and power and trust. Sometimes... What we think we need to be saved from is not always what God intends us to be saved from. Sometimes sometimes God just needs to save you from you. You can be your own worst enemy. You're so smart that you're dumb. You're so wise. The Bible says you become fools. Wise in your own eyes. Well, that's, that's not where you want to be wise. You want to be wise in God's eyes. Well, how do you get wise? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God. People don't fear God today. They fear poverty. They fear lack of power. They fear being alone. They fear not having power. But do you fear God? How did Jesus look at the situation? They cheered and he wept. He knew Jerusalem was about to be trampled underfoot. By the way, what an irony. Um, The Roman general, Titus, who ransacked Jerusalem in AD 70, his father was Vespasian. He was almost bankrupt and became a, a dealer in the buying and selling of donkeys or mules, and he became known as a muleal, M-U-L-I-A, muleal, or muleteer. Jesus rode in on a donkey, and Jerusalem was ransacked by the son of a muleteer, or a donkey-a-teer, if you will, somebody who dealt in donkeys. I, I just find the irony there so... Um, interesting to me. Jesus knew he'd come to die. The kingdom was at hand, but not the way they thought. He knew the Jerusalem hour of reckoning was approaching. Jerusalem wasn't ready. All those who cheered him on did so for selfish reasons. I'm sure you've never followed the Lord for selfish reasons, but if you watch Christian TV, you'll find yourself sucked in. If you'll send them money, you'll get money back. It's a Ponzi scheme. If you'll send enough money, God will do everything you ask. If you have enough faith to believe that you can give me your money, God will give you what you need. Really? 
What's the verse in the chapter for that? I'm not saying God doesn't tell people to give and sometimes sacrificially, but the point is God loves a cheerful giver, but it's not manipulative. Anytime you're manipulating, you're not working in the kingdom. So beware those people who manipulate, dominate, and intimidate. Manipulate, dominate, or intimidate. Stay away from those folks, whether they're preachers or anybody else in life. Don't be around people who dominate or intimidate or they manipulate. They'll mess you up. You'll get sucked in. Now, it is my observation that in life, I've watched among the followers of Jesus, there will always be religious snobs, people who think they know stuff about God. You know, it's way different to know stuff about him than to actually know him. The pretenders, the half-hearted, those people are always among the church. Jesus said there'll be tares among the wheat. Don't worry about it. I'll deal with that at the end. Let them come. Let them, let them participate. That makes no difference. I love them all. You love them all. I'll sort it out at the end. And believe you me, there will be a sorting at the end. That's why it's, the scriptures are so clear. Live right. Think right. Do right, Dudley. Dudley, do right? No. So when you say, save me, there's a question of from what to what? What are you willing to be saved from? And what are you willing to be saved to? Because if you've got this already wired, then your praises to the Lamb, your praises to God, they're, they're actually quite meaningless. One of the most dangerous things that you can do is confront people when their ideas are wrong. Jesus had that courage. I have that courage. It takes some courage to be able to say, I know what you think. You're incorrect. Sometimes you don't say anything. You just let it work out. But it's tough to look people in the eye and say, you're incorrect. The scripture says this. That, that's a tough one. So when you say save me, it might mean you have to abandon all of your props all your dreams, all your hopes. Now the question really is, are you willing to follow Jesus? There was a big crowd giving praise on Sunday. But by Thursday, they were yelling, crucify him. Same people. Give us Barabbas. Give us a murderer. We don't want this clown. We don't want this guy. Boy, he challenged what they thought. He challenged the religious people. He challenged the casual follower. He challenged them all. Unless you take up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. He didn't say, write me a check, get in line, the glory will come down. He said, forsake all and follow me. So when you say, save me, boy, I hope you're willing to let Jesus decide to save you, not just rescue you out of your circumstances. Most of us just want relief. We just want the pressure off. We want things to be better. We want everybody to just get along. Sometimes there is no getting along because when you hold the line, people have to choose whether or not they will go with you down that road. Some will not follow Jesus. You can still reach out to them. You can still be open and you can still love them. But you'll be tempted to compromise the standard which you've held. So my prayer for each of you, be a true follower of Jesus. If you can see Jesus as who he really is, Son of God, Savior, and you are willing to say, Lord, save me. Rescue me from whatever and take me wherever. I am going to follow you. You will never regret that. Father, would you help us to be willing to humble our hearts, cleanse our ways, decide that under no circumstances will we follow anyone but you. Thank you, Lord, that we can change our mind. 
Thank you, Lord, that there's no mistake so serious that you couldn't correct us, that we couldn't be forgiven, that we could not be redeemed. We can all be changed, transformed by the power of a living and loving Savior. Lord, many of us in this room are living proof that that's exactly what has occurred. We've surrendered and you've changed us from the inside out. Changed our mind. Changed our mouth. Changed the way our feet walk in this life. Change the way we do things. Lord, thank you for that. What a healing Jesus you are. Lord, thank you today for your word and for your sacrifice to come to endure all that you did on Passion Week. You paid the ransom we could not pay. Thank you, Lord. We bless your name. Now, as the old hymn says, may Jesus Christ be praised. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, God bless.